All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Keeping the Beat, an engaging web series hosted live by TNMEA in partnership with the CMA Foundation. Uh, tune in weeknights Monday through Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time to learn from and interact with music professionals from around the globe, representing every facet of the vast world of music. Uh, today is June 25th, and I'm Steve Snowden, and I'm a composer. Uh, tonight, I'll be talking to you about sounds from home, creativity, and collaboration at a distance. Um, I encourage you to interact by replying to this live video stream with your questions and comments, which I'll respond to throughout the hour with the assistance of our Keeping the Beat staff. Uh, one disclaimer, while this is being streamed live, it will remain on the Keeping the Beat Facebook page for future reference. So as such, your comments will also remain part of the archive. All right, let's get started. So I have PowerPoint. All right, sounds from home, uh, creativity and collaboration at a distance. Okay, so uh, before I get into any of this stuff, um, I wanted to just play some music because music, it's nice. I like to listen to music, why not? Uh, also, this seemed kind of fitting. So this piece is called Long Distance. Uh, and the movement is Monroe, North Carolina, 1977. This is for solo percussion and electronics. Uh, a little background on this piece. Uh, it's pretty well summed up with this quote in particular. Uh, Once upon a time in the days before the ubiqui ubiquitous and invisible internet, there was only one network. It was made of long distance lines, actual wires, and it was ruled by an absolute monarch, Ma Bell. Most people traveled the network along conventional channels, but there were also explorers, a small group of curious misfits eager to map the darkest, most obscure corners of this evolving global net. Uh, Harvard students, blind teenagers, budding engineers, eventually they came together and formed a subculture. They became phone freaks. And that's from author Jesse Hicks. Uh, so when I first learned about this, I was completely fascinated because these sound like my people. Um, nerdy people. Uh, and uh, luckily also they documented a lot of stuff. So in this piece, uh, the electronics that you hear, the audio that you hear, um, all comes from, aside from the live performer, all comes from reel to reel tape recordings that were made in the seventies by these phone freaks, uh, which I then chopped up into little pieces and did all kinds of different things to it. Um, I think it's pretty fun and it's a good way to, to start off things. And especially it kind of relates to what we're going through right now and also this talk in that uh, this was a way for people to explore the world without leaving their own home. And in some cases, they didn't really have a choice. Uh, for instance, there's one person in particular who's uh, name is Joy Bubbles, legally changed his name to Joy Bubbles, who was uh, uh, blind and was stuck in, I'm um, pretty sure, Minneapolis and uh, was able to navigate all of this uh, by whistling into the phone, whistling the right tones and the right patterns in order to dial far away distant places without having to pay long distance rates. Um, so I think it's kind of a fascinating thing and pretty fitting. So let's, uh, let's watch this video. Uh-oh, I didn't do the share screen. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me on track. All right, let's share screen. All right, desktop one, share. Let's try this again.
Okay. Um, all right, and I'm noticing on my end, at least, there's a lot of like crackling and distortion with the audio. And I think it has to do with the screen sharing. Is that something that other people are hearing as well? Like, shouldn't be super crackly. I mean, it's like this, you know, it's like old phone sounds, but uh, I don't know if you're hearing that as well. I'll just keep forging ahead. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, but Carrie, if you do hear like distortion and crackling and things like that, if you could let me know on the Google Doc, that'd be uh, helpful. Thanks. Um, so a little bit about me now. So I'm a uh, freelance composer uh, and I've been doing that full time for about uh, six or seven years, I guess. Um, I grew up in the Ozarks uh, in Southern Missouri. Uh, I did my undergrad at Missouri State University, although it was Southwest Missouri State University at the time. Uh, and uh, master's at University of Colorado in Boulder, and then doctorate at University of Texas in Austin. Uh, and I moved around a bunch. Aside from that as well, I lived in uh, Portugal for a year. Uh, I was there uh, on a Fulbright grant doing research in motion tracking technology for a collaboration between composers and choreographers. And I lived in Hong Kong for a year where I was a visiting professor of uh, music composition and theory. Um, and I'm really into, I don't exclusively do like electronic things. Uh, I guess it's about half and half, half acoustic and half involving electronics in some way, um, working with audio and field recordings and things like that. Um, I uh, really love that stuff though. Uh, and I found it to be like a real um, inspiration in a lot of ways. And I'll talk about that a little more and also how that could be an interesting thing for you or your students or colleagues as well. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about some influences of mine relating to this topic specifically. Uh, and the first one, you probably could have guessed it, is John Cage. Um, so I, I, I put it in this way, musical open-mindedness and the power of throwing the rules out the window. Um, and uh, this is an interesting quote, I think, from, uh, from Cage after he visited the anechoic chamber at Harvard University. So this is a room without sound. It's like the most silent place in the world, I guess, maybe aside from like deep inside some cave somewhere, but it's basically effectively silent. Um, but what he said after he visited there was in that room, I heard two sounds, whereas I expected to hear nothing. So when I got out of the room, I asked the engineer what those two sounds were. One was high and one was low. And he said, well, the high one was your nervous system in operation and the low one was the circulation of your blood. Therefore, even if I remained silent, I was under certain circumstances musical. Uh, I think that this is one of the most uh, powerful and greatest contributions of John Cage to music and art in general. Um, he's, he's known throughout the uh, visual art world and, and is a, um, a very important figure. Uh, and this whole concept that music can be anything, I think that's really what changed a lot. Uh, so even though he himself was not a minimalist, um, like Steve Reich um, or Philip Glass, uh, he actually didn't like minimalism really at all. Uh, I don't think that would have existed without him. Um, almost more of a philosopher in a way. Um, so moving on, uh, he wasn't necessarily the first one to come up with this. And these guys weren't necessarily either. Um, but this is an early example, the Italian futurists. So this is Luigi Russolo with his Intona Rumori. Uh, I always have trouble saying that. Uh, and that's his assistant uh, on the side, Ugo Piatti. Um, and the Intona Rumori, are basically noise making devices of different kinds, scratchy sounds, thumpy sounds, gurgly sounds with a uh, cone attached in order to amplify them. Uh, and their whole idea of this is to make an orchestra of sounds, non-musical sounds. Um, and this was a big inspiration to a lot of people. This is a very niche thing at the time, uh, but we look back at this kind of like uh, maybe Picasso in a way of the sort of collage of different materials and things all together. Um, or even, I think this is also kind of tied into the roots of modern percussion music. Uh, so uh, if you think of uh, Verez and ionization, which is widely considered uh, one of the very first important uh, works for a percussion ensemble. A lot of it consists of sounds that aren't really musical instruments. 
Um, and that's sort of given rise to a whole genre uh, of music. And for me in particular, even though I'm not a percussionist, I'm actually a horn player, but uh, most of my work, most of the commissions that I get involve uh, percussion in some way, including that's actually how I know uh, Julie Hill uh, is uh, her uh, trio commissioned me to write a, a piece uh, for them, a percussion trio. Uh, and it's been just a, a community that's very near and dear to my heart and I've gotten to know a lot of really wonderful people. Uh, I am pretty good at the spoons. I can't play the marimba to save my life, but I've gotten pretty good at the spoons, the Quebecois kind, the, uh, you know, like they're attached at the end, made out of maple, pretty great. Um, all right, so I wanna talk about somebody else here as well, and that is Pauline Oliveros. Um, and a lot of you probably know of her work as well. Um, and. Uh, I titled this Deep Listening and the Healing Power of Sound, or maybe the Spiritual Power of Sound. Um, and I really love this quote from her about deep listening. An aesthetic based upon principles of improvisation, electronic music, ritual, teaching, and meditation, this aesthetic is designed to inspire both trained and untrained performers to practice the art of listening and responding to environmental conditions in solo and ensemble situations. And I think with Cage and with the Futurists, and uh, with Pauline Oliveros, uh, one of the core principles of this is that you don't have to be a trained musician in order to do this. It's all about intent of listening and context. Uh, so next we have Pierre Schaeffer, uh, and he is one of the early pioneers of acousmatic music or electroacoustic music. Uh, he was working before uh, digital audio was a thing. Uh, and would actually work with like discs, like LPs and cut them into pieces and splice them together and that sort of thing. Um, but he is also very important as a kind of uh, philosopher as well um, when it comes to sound. So he coined this term sound object in uh, Treatise on Musical Objects and Essay Across Disciplines in 1966. The unit of sound, sound object, is the equivalent to a unit of breath or articulation, a unit of instrumental gesture. The sound object is therefore an acoustic action and intention of listening. Um, so again, it's intent. And what I think is kind of interesting about this, so if we were to take the word acousmatic, so that's something that's used with electronic music. And for those of you who are familiar with electronic music or have done some composing uh, with this sort of thing, um, uh, it's, it's a term that's like used pretty frequently with that. And I, I dug into it a little bit, the etymology of it, and it was first used by the ancient Greeks and describes an audio only presentation of sounds free from the distraction and association with the sound sources. Uh, so in a way, like when you listen to uh, like something on your phone or you're listening to music, like recorded music, it's acousmatic in a way. But the whole idea is that the sound is uh, divorced from the object that produces the sound. So if I were to play the sound of a dog barking, you might imagine a dog, like picture a dog in your mind. But the idea here is that a dog barking, the sound itself is just a uh, it's, it's just a spectrum of frequency and amplitude over time, and that's it. Interesting concept. I don't know if it's really possible unless you do you practice that a lot, kind of like meditation. You know, I've heard before that at some point you can get to this real sense of like loss of ego through meditation. It's not going to happen the first time. You got to spend a lot of time doing that. And I think the same goes for sound object. Um, all right. So when... Uh, when all the lockdowns started with COVID-19 uh, and uh, things were starting to get kind of weird, um, my, my wife is actually a freelance violist uh, here in Boston. Oh, by the way, I live in Boston. Did I say that already? Anyway, um, and uh, she plays with lots of orchestras, a lot of Baroque stuff, a lot of modern stuff. Um, and within about a 36 hour window, every gig that she had planned out all the way through August was canceled. Every, I mean, just email after email. And it was a shock. And for me, I was getting those emails as well, but all of my stuff was getting moved back by nine months or a year, all of my commissions and premieres. Um, it was a shock when that happened. And, uh, you know, the first thought is like, what are we gonna do? Um, but also I was thinking like, I mean, for us personally, but for everyone, like, how are we going to respond to this? Or what do we do as musicians, as a community, 
um, when we can't actually get together? And these three questions are really the things that came to mind. How do we continue to create and collaborate in the era of social distancing? How have our roles changed as performers and composers? And what does this mean for the future of our profession and art? Um, I don't, I, I don't know when we're going to be playing again, basically. So what do we do? And I was thinking about other people as well. Like I mentioned before that I've been really active in the percussion community. And for a lot of them, it's even harder because they don't have access to instruments. There are a lot of college students out there, especially who only have a snare drum and a practice pad at home. They don't have access to a marimba or timpani or a big bass drum or toms or a lot of the things that they would normally be playing because they're all housed at institutions. They can't afford to own them themselves. And I just thought, what are they gonna do? Um, so the other thing that I thought about as well is this whole idea of soundscapes. Uh, so we talked before about these um, influences of mine and sort of listening to the world around you and, uh, and, and taking it in and thinking of it as music. If you put it in the right context, it is music. But our soundscapes have become drastically contracted because of this. We're stuck at home and we have been for three months now. I don't even know. It feels like 10 years or it feels like three days. I'm not even sure. But it's, uh, it's really limiting. Normally, you know, you'd be getting on the bus to go to class or you'd be driving to school and, you know, to teach or you'd be going to rehearsal. Um, all those different soundscapes um, and I should define that like soundscapes, basically like right where I am right now, the soundscape that I'm hearing is my computer fan going, there's some birds out there. My cat meowed earlier. And I think my wife is making tea right now. That's the soundscape of this place that I'm in my home. And that's where we're all kind of confined to our homes. And so there's a lot less variety in all of that. We're sort of stuck with these sounds all the time. Uh, and I was curious about that as well. So that's why I created phase one of Sounds From Home. Uh, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to encourage people to listen uh, to what's around them, to um, record that ex like experience and, and really think about, other, you know, with deep listening, it's, you know, just taking in the sounds that are around you and appreciating those things. Um, appreciating the soundscape that you live in. Uh, and I was really curious about the soundscapes that people have. So I put out this open call for recordings of Sounds From Home. So I'll open up the web page here. There we go. Um, so I've got all this stuff here. I mean, this is kind of extensive, but I had to address like some questions and things. There is a comment from Matt Teodori's mom, which is uh, pretty sweet. Um, so I built this page where people can upload a sound. So you can record with whatever you have, with your phone, if you've got a, a field recorder, whatever you got, um, and you can just upload it and I'll see it. And then it goes into the sound library. Um, from there, um, well, I'll, I'll read you this in, the, in a nutshell. Um, record some sound, some of the sounds around you during this time of isolation. I'll write a piece for open instrumentation plus electronics based on those recordings. There's no commission fee and it'll be free for everyone. And this library of sonic snapshots will also be publicly available so that others can make music with it too. And one of the things when I first started this that I was concerned with, uh, and actually I, I even um, uh, addressed this a little bit immediately at least with um, something I was calling these long days, but there are a lot of people out there that are struggling with income right now. And of course I need to charge for music. It's part of like the way I make my living. Um, but I, uh, I actually made a bunch of pieces of mine free for the month of April um, so that people could just work on something. These are solo pieces with electronics. I thought maybe that'd help a little bit. Um, and in this case as well, uh, it's important to me that uh, it's, it's not going to be a financial burden on anybody. Um, so in this case, uh, sounds from home, I completed the phase one. So you can go here and you can download this for free for $0. If you want to donate, uh, to this organization, uh, I encourage that as well. 
but whatever you need to do. Um, so I wanted to make this freely available to people. So let me go back to Oh, here we go. I've got too many. I have like four screens around me right now. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so the uh, audio library that I got, we're leaving Keynote again. Um, people would just upload things. And this is the uh, original samples that I got. So there are a lot of things in here. Um, most of these, I. Some of them are from people that I know. Some of them are from people that I've never met before and I don't know at all. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of nice. So to give you an example of some of the things that, uh, that I received, how about this one here? So this is Rue. She is a, uh, an author that I know uh, and her daughter is taking voice lessons over Zoom, of course. So that's part of her soundscape, her daughter taking voice lessons, as well as like just lots of other things. And that was, that's one of the really amazing things about this for me, at least. Um, for instance, um, Nathan Cohen uh, is a friend of mine who is a musician, but not a composer. He well, he teaches high school, actually. He teaches high school music in Gloucester, in Rockport, Mass. And he sent me a bunch of recordings of his kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that one. Um, but that was a really fascinating thing to realize that the soundscape for a lot of people, um, I got a lot of recordings of kids, because if you've got young kids at home, that's what you're hearing all the time. Also, a lot of kitchen recordings, lots of chopping, lots of coffee, um, and a lot of other, like some outdoors things. Uh, let's see, Michelle Chang, she sent a barred, a barred owl, recording of a barred owl. Um, so it's a really lot, it's a lot of fascinating stuff and I had no idea what I was going to get out of that. Um, but I thought, uh, I should just go with it, go for it. So, um, I would like to go ahead and play the, uh, result of this. Oh, except that I wanted to show you really quickly. Yeah. So I made the, um, library available for anyone. And then I, made a piece for open instrumentation using these sounds um, so that even if you just got like pots and pans or whatever, you can play it. Um, or glass jars, if you got a drum kit, or if you've got eight saxophones, I don't know, whatever you got, you can play it. Um, and you don't need any special equipment or anything like that. Um, so I just sort of categorize the sounds as um, dry percussive sounds, ringing resonant sounds, and a scraping sound. And then people can figure it out from there. Oh, and these are the, in the middle of the screen, these are the people that uh, contributed to, uh, to this. Uh, and here's the score. Uh, now, I don't know why it made it transparent, but it looks awesome like that. So I think from now on, I'm gonna have rainbow gradient transparent scores. It looks really good. <laughs> um, so I, I tried to make the notation as approachable as possible. So, I mean, you have to learn some new things. That's always the case with percussion, basically, unless you only play marimba. Um, and uh, you can just play with a stereo. You don't need an interface or microphones or anything like that. Um, all right, so let's take a listen to this. I 
Hey, I'm going to try. The audio is really bothering me. I don't know if that is the case for you as well. It's really distorted. So I'm going to try playing it from somewhere else. It has something to do with the screen share. Uh, Zoom settings. All right, I'm getting some information here. Echo cancellation. All right. All right. I'm learning something new here. All right, I'm gonna go to settings. I'm sure you're all pretty used to this right now, right? It's like you're in the middle of something and then, uh, let's see, so is that under audio? Advanced maybe? Suppress intermittent background noise, echo cancellation. It's either auto or aggressive. <laughs> That's my only two options. <laughs> auto or aggressive. Uh, persistent back noise, background noise. I'm going to disable that. Okay, echo cancellation. I only have auto or aggressive. Um, I'm going to disable that. Intermittent background noise. Okay, all the background noise disabled. Got it. All right. Thank you. Man, what a time we're living in. I'm looking at a Google Doc on my iPad. I've got two screens up here so I can check notes. There's a lot going on. Okay, let's see if this is any better here. Luckily, this piece is under three minutes long. So uh, hopefully uh, we can get it going this time. All right. So that's phase one of sounds from home. Uh, and hopefully I could still hear some distortion there, uh, but it's Zoom also. If you wanna go uh, check it out on your own, take another listen, uh, you can just go to my website and it's, uh, it's right there. Um, so I 
knew that there's more I could do with this. I mean, honestly, that was like, I don't know how many hours of just editing samples and audio files that I got from people um, to make that work. Like the actual composition of it, once that was done, uh, was pretty easy. And actually, um, or not easy, but it was a lot easier than <laughs> editing all the samples down. And actually here is it, uh, get rid of that. Um, so this is my Cubase session. So I use Cubase, I'm kind of old school. Um, these are all samplers up here that I created and these are just audio files floating around in here. Um, but if we were to go over here, I can show you in contact. Um, so this is the sample software that I use for this. So it's all, it all works like that. And if I were to open up the, I don't know, like short percussive one. There's all the wood blocks. So basically I got a single audio file that had a kid, Zeke, Matt Teodori's kid, I'm pretty sure his name is Zeke, uh, playing with blocks. So I cut out each clank of the block um, and then did the same for, this is, these are all clocks. Strangely, I had three different people that sent me recordings of clocks, grandfather clocks and cuckoo clocks. So, there's, there's the lawnmower. I love that lawnmower sound. These are kitchen sounds, knives and things. Um, so it was a lot of work to do that, um, but it was like really rewarding. Um, like I was getting a very intimate look into like the day-to-day -day lives of all these people. Uh, I think there were like 30 of them all together and I ended up getting, I don't know, like 80 sounds or something. And then I trimmed them down into like a couple hundred samples. Um, but it was a really interesting process to do that. But I knew that there could be more. And so I wanted to uh, go with a second phase. I don't know how many phases there are going to be, but we were talking about phases in the news and I thought, why not? We'll call it phases. In fact, my wife suggested that when we were out uh, looking for mushrooms, which by the way, John Cage was a big mushroom fanatic, he even wrote a book about it and helped support himself uh, in his younger years by foraging for mushrooms and selling them to restaurants and things. Kind of cool. Anyway, uh, I talked to um, uh, some friends of mine at Fifth House Ensemble, and they're a group in Chicago. I've worked with them on a number of occasions, different projects and things, and they've commissioned some stuff from me. Uh, and they run a festival in the summer called Fresh Ink Festival. And they were interested in having me there as a faculty member uh, this year, but then they couldn't have it in person. So they did it online and they said, let's wait till next year. And I said, Hey, that's cool. And then I said, uh, Hey, I got this weird idea. Any thoughts of what I could possibly do with this? And they said, you yeah, know, I don't know, but uh, why don't you bring it to uh, fresh ink and we'll just put a group together and uh, we'll just see what happens. So they put me with um, 12 people uh, all together and, um, uh, performers and composers, most of them kind of college aged, uh, like, uh, uh, like, I don't know, grad school or undergrad. Um, and they were extremely creative people. And what we ended up building with this was actually an app. So I wanted to show you the app really quickly. Um, so let's see, I need to go to this. So I built this in Max, uh, Max MSP. Uh, I'm Imagine some of you used this before. Um, I really wanted to make this like a web only kind of thing using uh, JavaScript and web API, uh, but I just didn't have the time. We only had like four days to put this together from starting from this question of like, what is this thing and what do we do with it until actually presenting it? We had about four days. So I went with Max because that's what I know. Um, so what we did with this is we actually took um, this idea of a house, different rooms in a house um, because we're, and houses or apartments or that sort of thing. That's where we're stuck right now. Um, and try to kind of combine the experiences of different people at the same time uh, in a musical sort of way. So one of the things that we did from that is we put together the spreadsheet, uh, love spreadsheets, and uh, we picked six rooms. So bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, living room, outdoor, laundry room. We picked people to film those rooms in their house, uh, in, in their home, uh, and so, for instance, I did the, uh, the bedroom video, uh, Eric bathroom, Spencer kitchen, and so on. Uh, and then we uh, have improvisers uh, for each of those rooms. And then there is another group that determines parameters for improv. So in this case, for the bedroom, Eric uh, decided BED makes sense. Yeah. 
so the instructions here start by playing B, E, D in that order, uh, but feel free to switch it up, uh, switch up the order as the video progresses. Uh, some of them are more, so let's see for the bathroom, this is interesting. Um, Ba improvise based on the sounds of different faucets, shower heads, etc. in a bathroom. Sometimes they drip, stream, gush, leak. Try to imitate those sounds and then also pitch instructions. So everybody got these kind of loose instructions on what to do with that. So in the app, what we did was uh, this. Where do we go first? Let's start in the bathroom. So here we have two improvisers. One is me. I'm playing uh, metal mixing bowls with water in them and uh, balloons, like water balloons with a bunch of air also, and it sounds like a big bass drum. And then there's a flute. You can adjust the levels of each player, and you can adjust pan. Great. <laughs> and we have this six-minute video of Eric um, in the bathroom uh, with contacts and teeth brushing and all that sort of thing. Uh, and if you want to, and it, this is all just on a loop. So you can leave and you can come back and it's exactly like you left it. Um, so uh, if we check out some of the other rooms, here we have laundry. All right, and we also have the kitchen. All right, <laughs> uh, we have the living room. <laughs> that one always cracks me up so that's Elizandro. he's the clarinetist in fifth house ensemble and then there was a harp and somebody playing in this inside the piano and it's pretty goofy sounding it's great uh you can even go outside Kind of fitting that it's a horn. That's an outdoor instrument. And I'm a horn player. I, I would think, I think it's an outdoor instrument, really. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite combos here in the bedroom. So there are three improvisers, and uh, they're given pretty basic instructions. Let's see, bedroom. Oh, yeah, this is the BED thing. And I'm really amazed at how well it all fit together. So horn, harp, and then piano, like inside the piano, like muted and that sort of thing. So I, I want to watch this one for a little bit longer than the others. All right, I could listen to that all day. In fact, when I got those audio files from them originally, I pretty much listened to it all day. I just layered the three of them and it's great. Uh, so last, I would wanna just go ahead and show the names of the folks involved here. All right, so that was a really fun project. And I think there's more that can be done with this. I mean, it's not a masterpiece. It's a, you know, kind of a fun experiment. Um, but maybe this is something where I'm kind of considering my role as a composer 
how else could I approach uh, approach things? I, that's something maybe I didn't mention so much before just questioning that role because I composers organize things. That's basically it, right? You organize notes on a page, dots and lines, and you organize people and you put form to things. So what can I do with that experience and that skill set that I've developed when I can't like people can't rehearse and things like that. Um, so is this the answer? Like this, this thing that I just built? Yeah, no, probably not, but it might be kind of a step in the right direction or a direction of some kind. Uh, so that was kind of the goal um, with this. So let me go back to my slideshow. Uh, so another thing that I, or kind of where I wanted to go with all of this though is um, as all of this stuff, oh, you can see my notes down here too. Great. Um, with all of this stuff, um, I feel really lucky to have a background in electronic music, honestly, because being isolated doesn't really change a whole lot. And it's one of those things that is for me, uh, a real source of, um, of joy making music with audio, like just working with digital audio and I think it can be a really great thing for a lot of other people too. So maybe for you as teachers, as musicians, as performers, composers, or for your students. Um, I've actually, I have a quite a bit of experience teaching electronic music as well. So for four years at uh, UT Austin, um, I was teaching electronic music composition, both beginning and intermediate. And it was a blast. I also taught some sound design here at Berkeley in Boston um, just for a semester, but I love this sort of stuff. And I think it's a real uh, expressive form of art. Um, yeah, there's a learning curve, but I don't think it's any more of a learning curve than, you know, like the violin or an oboe. Uh, so uh, I think it's something worth exploring. So I wanted to go through these things here, uh, the benefits that I've experienced as an artist uh, working with digital audio and electronic music. Can I move my, yeah, oh well. Um, okay, first one. Uh, it provided the initial gateway for me to start composing by removing barriers of notation and music theory, and it still does. And I think this is a really important point that, um, so I got started in music really late. I was 16 when I first, 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 first learned to read music and, um, uh, and just got into it. Uh, and then even when I was in college, I never really considered composing. It just seemed like too much. Like there's, I need to know more like counterpoint and, uh, you know, tonal harmony and all of these things. Um, and those are really important as well, but you can make music without knowing any of that stuff and, and still get that sense of satisfaction and still be creating things. Um, so I think this is especially applicable to, uh, people who grew up, uh, uh, maybe without a lot of access to, let's say they live in very rural areas. I mean, Tennessee has a lot of rural, very rural areas. And that was the same case for me in the Ozarks. I didn't really have, uh, the closest place I could go to get horn lessons was an hour away in Springfield, Missouri. So, um, you know, get, taking lessons and things like that, I can be difficult for some people, or it might be economic circumstances. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, working with sound in this way, working with digital audio and electronic music, um, you just need a computer and you don't even need a great computer to do it. So I'll, I'll keep going here. Um, it definitely expanded my perception of what music is or can be. And like I'd mentioned uh, with the folks before, uh, Cage and Oliveros and Schaefer, um, they have a very different concept of what music is beyond our more like kind of confined sense of that in the sort of classical tradition. And I think that's also really powerful. It's very uh, welcoming. Uh, and, you know, I should mention also that I, if it weren't for um, learning about electronic music, I uh, wouldn't have become a composer. It just, uh, I think the, the, the hurdle was too high, or I felt like it was at the time, but it was something that gave me a lot of confidence to move, uh, um, to, 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 to try that out, to actually start composing music. And now that's what I do for a living. Um, so this, I guess this is like very important uh, uh, to me and I think it can be really helpful for other people. Uh, so it pushed me to learn a lot more about acoustics. I think knowing a lot about acoustics is so helpful for any musician or any person really. I mean, it's, you know, one of our major senses. Um, but 
uh, it's just uh, knowing even beyond the acoustics of your own instrument, just uh, like on a more scientific level, I think it's really powerful uh, and it's really great to know about that. Um, and I, my mind is like blown on a regular basis when it comes to acoustics, because I'll read more, I'll learn more about things. Um, like look up the head related transfer function, head related transfer function. Sounds crazy, I know. That, that totally blew my mind when I first learned about that, that I'd never even considered that before. But there's just so much to uncover and to learn about sound uh, and how we perceive sound that I think really can be a, a, um, really useful for us as musicians. Um, it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me uh, in terms of interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, a lot of these things... Oh, okay. Looking at some questions coming up here. Um, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, for instance, like I've worked a lot with uh, choreographers. I've written a lot of music for dance and it is way easier if there are, um, if I can provide some kind of mock-up, if it's for an acoustic performance, like if there are musicians playing acoustic instruments or if it's entirely electronic, I can give that to them and they can work with that. Um, and that's really helpful. And the same goes for musicians. If I'm writing a string quartet, if I can give them a mock-up of the piece that I'm working on, they can get an idea of like how it fits together before they even start rehearsing it. And I think that can be really valuable as well. So a question here. <clears throat> hmm, how can educators encourage their students to explore the sounds around them? Uh, I've tried listening journals, but I would like it for, be, for it to be a meaningful experience. I have an idea. Um, I, well, a couple. I've got a slide kind of about this sort of thing. Um, for any of you who didn't see Danny Clay's presentation on Keeping the Beat, watch that. It's, I, I, it was so fun and also so enlightening. This is a person who works with a lot of uh, young kids. He's a, he's a very accomplished composer as well, but he the, the sort of joy and playfulness and everything that he does is just fascinating. Um, and uh, he talked a lot about um, basic things like, uh, oh, what was it? It was a, uh, like a treasure hunt, a sound treasure hunt. Um, there were some really great uh, things that he had in there. Uh, and I would definitely encourage anybody uh, to watch that uh, as well, because he explains things really well. Um, and uh, all in all, just a really great presentation. And actually, our two presentations are kind of similar. It's like mine is sort of the follow up to his, I would say, in a way, uh, where I'm talking to more about kind of how you work with audio once you've captured it. Um, but I'll keep going with this because I don't want to I don't want to drag on uh, too long. But I do have some things, some suggestions of uh, that sort of thing as well. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, this kind of thing is very easy to do from home with little to no special equipment. Um, and you can do it alone or in collaboration with others very easily. And I've done that a lot before, like people across the world where we're sharing ideas, we're sharing audio files, we're able to put things together. It's really satisfying and you can just do it from home. Um, and uh, last but not least, the skills that you learn working with audio can apply to lots of other things that you do as well. So if you or your students need to record a video or record audio for an audition, or if you need to like edit some audio for something, or I mean, there are a lot of uh, circumstances in which understanding audio uh, well, I think can be really, really helpful, not just to play around with it and make you know funny soundscapes and things. Um, so how do I get started? Tools, all right, computer, that's basically it. I mean, if you've got, if, if it can like, navigate Facebook, odds are that computer can work with audio. Uh, we're at a point right now where uh, technology is uh, like processing speeds and things like that. It's really not a concern unless you're trying to run like a huge, like Hans Zimmer sample library or something like that. Um, so just some headphones and a computer. Uh, for recording, yeah, you can get a microphone. You could just use your phone. There are a lot of options for that. Um, also with microphones, there's just, there's tons of them out there and, and a lot of like very affordable options. Uh, that will get you better audio, USB mics, or even um, I have uh, the Rode, oh, here it is, Rode IXY. This is just, it attaches to your um, iPhone. I know Zoom, uh, not this Zoom, but the audio company Zoom, um, 
uh, also makes one. Uh, so there are a lot of options for that. I carry this thing around with me all over the place to just record any interesting sounds I happen to encounter when I'm out hiking, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's great too. Um, the, uh, for software, if you don't have it already, get Audacity. It's free and it's awesome. It's, it's a really powerful and simple digital audio workstation, a DAW. Um, and I, I, it's definitely the place to start. Um, and I'll show you a little bit with that uh, here in just a minute. Um, with other software, there's Ableton Live, there's Logic, Cubase, Pro Tools. I, so you do have to pay for those, but you usually get a free trial at least a month. And I think right now they're doing even more than that because of the pandemic. They're actually giving like two months or they give you a lot of time. Um, when it comes to Ableton Live, if you're doing something that has like any kind of interactivity, uh, it's really great. Uh, so I actually even have like a very short video. So I did this with Ableton Live. This is, um, yeah. Um, let's see here, keynote. Yeah, so that was some moss uh, with a feather and I just had it super amplified and was doing live audio processing. And honestly, it's not that difficult to get into it. The thing is that this software has become like pretty mainstream in a lot of ways, which can be kind of a bad thing, but it's also kind of a good thing because it's more approachable. So Ableton, DJs use it. People use it for like experimental music. I've used it a bunch for like interactive, interdisciplinary, collaborative things. I mean, it's really flexible. There's a lot you can do. I think it's really great. You have Logic, Cubase, Pro Tools, all those th sorts of things. They basically all do the same thing. Um, but if you wanna get more in depth than what you could normally do with Audacity, yeah, you can look into that as well. Um, there are tons of resources online with any of this software. It's a huge community out there. Um, for this sort of thing. And uh, speak it, and you don't, you don't really even need to take classes for this. I mean, you can, it'll help, but you could learn basically everything you need to know on YouTube when it comes to this. There's so many people using Ableton Live right now. There's tons of resources for that. Um, and uh, freesound.org, I love that place. It's just, it's a community of people who are nerds about sound and they upload sounds and you can download them. There's thousands, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, maybe millions of sounds. Some of them are like okay quality. Some of them are incredible. People with like super high end microphones and it's from all over the place. You could hear like, I don't know, like pigeons from Morocco or uh, like alligators in Florida or I don't know, jet planes, like whatever, whatever you're looking for, it's on, um, on free sound. Um, okay, so getting started. Again, I rec recommend watching Danny Clay's, um, I think I'm saying that right, Danny Clay. Um, I wasn't familiar with his work before, uh, but I loved that uh, presentation that he did here on keeping the beat. Um, uh, and uh, he's got a lot of really great ways, especially for students to get started with this sort of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm saying here, start building a field recording library. And that's a great idea. Encouraging students, I think uh, um, that a lot of Danny's suggestions are really great for that. So I don't wanna just go over it again. Um, but beyond that, once you do have sounds or once your students do have sounds, um, you can try a few things. Out. I mean, there are a lot of options and maybe you'll come up with, I don't know, I think we have like a, a document thing, right? Like I can send a PDF or whatever with this where you can download it. I might include some more. Yes. Great. <laughs> Immediate response. I like that. Um, so I might include some more suggestions because I have taught this sort of thing a lot before. I can go through older projects and, and give some suggestions on that, on ways to get started. Um, uh, so here's some like basic ideas. Create an imaginary landscape. So, uh, or imaginary soundscape, imaginary landscape. Ah, uh, it's cage, it's in my brain. So uh, if you're thinking about different soundscapes, like create something impossible. Right? I mean, you could put together a collection of sounds like it's a poker game underwater or it's like a dog fight between a, a jet and a house fly. I, like there's anything is possible and that's the cool part about it. You can make it totally surreal. And there is tons of great um, sound art out there. If you look for like acousmatic music um, and I can even, I'll, I can give some suggestions as well. So if, uh, if once I email a document, all that sort of thing, I'll have some listening suggestions of some really cool stuff um, where people are telling a story with sound, which is also really cool. Just use sound recordings to piece that together, make something cool out of it. Um, 
and uh, and it's just really fun. Uh, and you could find the similarities between two sounds and plow uh, play around with that. Spectral morphology, that's a really big word. Uh, <laughs> I think it's intentionally really big, um, kind of a silly word. Uh, basically, that means uh, just the change in the sound spectrum over time. So like it's the sonic signature of a sound over time. Um, that's pretty cool too. Or uh, one of the assignments that I remembered uh, from a while back, it's been like seven years since I've taught this, but um, to phonetically recreate a spoken phrase with found sounds. So if you were to take the word Sasquatch and you have your field recording library, you could use like the sound of water running for that. And you could use a, I don't know, some kind of pitch sound for the ah uh, and Squatch. I, it's fun to try that sort of thing out as well. If you arrange sounds and kind of EQ them in the right way, or if you manipulate them in the right way, you can create some really cool stuff. Um, and I should say too, with Audacity, that um, uh, that there are a lot of things built into that where you can stretch sounds out, you can pitch shift them, uh, you can reverse them. I mean, that's, that was, I, I still remember the first time I had an audio file and I reversed it and listened to it. I think it was a recording of me reading out of a manual and it was like, oh, wow, I can do that. I can play things in reverse. It was like a mind blowing moment. Um, it's really, really fun. But just like, so what I've written here, just like acoustic musical instruments, you can learn to push the boundaries to create something entirely unique. Um, so the more and more you learn, the, the more you can express with this sort of thing. Um, so I wanted to show one, this is like a, 15 second example of uh, uh, spectromorphology sort of like cross between sounds. I have a piece for uh, trombone and interactive, interactive electronics called Ground Round. And it's a lot of the audio, it's um, cows and cattle auctioneers and there's live trombone. Uh, and I wanted to show kind of the way that those kind of blend together, um, kind of make one composite sound. So play that. All right. <laughs> so um, we're at an hour right now. Um, if uh, we have any more questions, I'll be watching the Google Doc over here as it automatically moves, updates. Uh, and I wanted to show, uh, show you Audacity uh, real quick. So there we go. So this looks a little complicated, but it's just several tracks of audio. And um, I actually um, uh, composed or put together this thing uh, in Audacity. I didn't use Cubase or any kind of fancy software. Um, a friend of mine, um, Courtney, uh, Courtney Swain, she's in a band called Bent Knee. If you haven't heard them before, you absolutely have to check them out. Um, but I got some vocal tracks from her uh, from an album they did a while back and just put pieces from different songs on the album, put it all together. And it was awesome. So it's only like a minute and 45. I kind of want to play through this. And maybe um, if there are other questions, if you want to go ahead and ask those, and I'll see if those come up on the screen. And otherwise, I think that'll about wrap it up. So let's, let's take a listen to this. I don't know if I can find my mouse. Too many screens. Okay. Oh! 
All right. So I'll just go back to here. Stop the screen share. Okay. Um, so I haven't seen any other questions on the Google, the Google. Um, but uh, if you do have more, um, please feel free to like contact me anytime. Uh, my email is just stevensnowden at gmail.com. Um, and it's up on my website too. If you want to check other things out, I've got a bunch of music and stuff there. Um, but I'm genuinely really interested in, in encouraging people and helping people uh, work with audio in this way because it's been such a powerful uh, thing for me artistically. It's, it's made a big difference in my life. Uh, and I think it can be that way for a lot of other people, uh, especially in a time right now where we're all stuck at home. Uh, so if that's it, the Google has not told me there are any questions coming up. So, oh, great. Okay, I think we're good to go. So get a little tag that I'm gonna read at the end here. And uh, yeah, feel free to drop me a line anytime uh, and I'll upload, um, okay. All good, great job. This is, this is great. I've got Google talking to me over here. I've got, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, uh, so feel free to contact me anytime. I'm very open with all this stuff in my process and all these kinds of things. Um, so here's our, uh, oh yeah, our tagline here. So tune in weeknights, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central to watch Keeping the Beat Live and remember to tell your friends about our program. All right, it's great to be here. See you around.